it's Matt Martin here from Photo Book Cafe and thank you for joining us for our new series called Behind the Photo Book. Within this series we are going to be talking to a range of different photographers covering zines to monographs to self-publishing to working with a publisher. We were going to be talking to people that run bookshops and also people that publish and uh, run distribution as well. So we want to be able to cover a wide range all within the publishing sphere based around photography. Our first guest is Oliver Griffin, who is um, <clears throat> a dear friend, um, an amazing artist, bookmaker, zine maker, binder, BMXer, bike guy. Um, and we had a really great chat uh, talking about one of his publications called Photocopies. Um, really interesting to get a short little background into Griff's work and his process in making zines and especially behind this book itself. So thank you for joining us. Uh, this series is sponsored by Rapid Eye Darkrooms, so please check out Rapid Eye. It's a pro lab that's uh, part of Photo Book Cafe and everything that we do here. Uh, it's just based just down the road from us. Um, so please check them out if you want to get anything processed or if you're looking for darkroom workshops or anything like that. And also Photo Book Cafe, if you haven't seen us or come to us before, uh, we're based in Shoreditch in London. We're a photo book cafe, in, which means we're a photo book library. So we have a donated collection from photographers of over 600 photo books within our, within our cafe space. Uh, we also do book launches. Uh, we have a gallery space. We do workshops. Anything that you can think around photo books and photography, we're involved in it. So please come and check us out. So I'm going to hand us over and I hope you enjoy our chat with Oliver Griffin. So, Oliver Griffin, we are here to talk about photocopiers. We are indeed. Well, you're the man to like nerd out on them as well. So exactly, we've got one in the background over here. Um, so with this conversation, it's just really sort of. So we're talking particularly about this one zine that you've made, which is called Photocopiers. Well, uh, technically, it's now three. But three. Yeah, it's yeah. It started out as a very. Uh, fundamental project when I was doing my degree and turned into this beast that is a legacy now to me. Okay. Yeah. So we're on third edition. Last edition. Last edition and started making them in? Um, there was a project I did while in Falmouth College of Arts that turned into Falmouth University College. Anyway, at Falmouth. Uh, and I had this idea of photograph every single photocopier in the Wood Lane campus which is not that big it's basically okay. <laughs> like it's very tranquil like very sweet rolls down the hill there's about like half a dozen buildings right a few admin blocks it's like it's really like a lot like college in your mind's eye it's kind of what Black Mountain kind of esque middle of okay. nowhere yeah, yeah, yeah. you sign up because you're like you look at the map and you're like I want to escape there yeah, yeah yeah but it's quite it's one of those places that also a lot of artists are drawn to to teach okay uh, they were anyway or well they are now um so yeah just uh had this lovely idea of photocopy photographing all the photocopiers within this cool small campus thinking there can't be that many of them right and so we have this like we have this leading text, which is photocopies, yeah. the evaluation of space, part 3B. Yeah, very important, part 3B. Let's make sure we get this straight in the middle. Um, and then we've got all roots, bloody roots. Roots, bloody roots, so, yeah. So that is also all, most of my works have a objective and subject of title to like counteract each other because no work is completely objective or subjective. But right. I'm very, my prime objective of using photography is as a objective medium. But the problem with photography is that a person has to handle it. So that's when 
it becomes subjective, the whole idea of pointing it somewhere. At that point, my heart was very much into a lot of punk. Yeah. A lot of rock and roll. Nice. A lot of making things look, sh look, look, things that look good look, look really shit. <laughs> So, yeah, so it's going back to like the whole ethos of why use a why use a photocopier to make work. So then like we're trying to sort of behind the sort of backstory of, of finding these photocopiers within the university. It wasn't that hard. You just have to walk around for five seconds and right, ask and people. Found everything. <laughs> and like the hardest thing was like all photography is actually persuading someone to actually let you photograph it without them like making you look like an idiot. Right. Which is fine because the, like, the reason the book is in this weird shape is because at that point I was very much into using large format photography. And it was that era that digital was semi coming in, but you were got taught from the get-go, how to use transparency and 5.4 as like a given. And the university, the college, had a this weird trade account with Polaroid. Okay. So if you wanted any Polaroid film, you could get it for like super cheap. Right. And I mean any Polaroid film. So at that point, I was using a lot of 5.4 Polaroid films. So the whole the so how many images are in the book? I've forgotten. Five, six? No, it's like ten? Yeah, somewhere around then. So we start off with so when we go into the image section, we've also got the information of who was able to use that photocopier or just where they were located. Well there was just location. Basically right. location. I like to note look if anyone can got a keen eye. This is actually the photography, photography office, and in the background, there's a Hasselblad poster, which I think is a very good introduction to the whole. Let's see if we can lift that out. Which is like, uh, if I ever get hold of one of those posters, I'll be a very happy person. <laughs> but no, it's very just like basic information, location. I think that's all that's needed, really. Mm. No one really cares what make the photocopier is or where it is or what's happening. Everyone just cares that it's working. And yeah. there's no red flashing buttons. <laughs> Which you can get a lot. Oh, my goodness, yeah. Which is kind of why we love them. Well, that's when you just got to hit them a bit harder in the right place, yeah, right? Exactly. It's usually just a jam or something. But they are very indestructible. And you do find there's a good variety within an institution, depending on the contract supplier of printing materials to the institution. Yeah. But I kind of like, so in the, in the pretext, you kind of talk about how, where they're located, like in the sense that you would see them in the corner of the room, sort of yeah. this giant sort of subject. So it's, it's nice being able to sort of see because they always do sort of just live in sort of an odd space. Oh my goodness, they do, yeah. This is the reason why I, with the abundance of film and and this very small environment, I just didn't really count how many there were. I just kind of asked too many questions to the wrong people <laughs> and just walked around with this 5.4 camera and tried to jam it into the smallest spaces possible to capture these machines in some very awkward office locations mm. which some was i think there's one i couldn't shoot because literally the room was the size of the photocopier okay <laughs> so i couldn't even fit the camera the door. in i think if i i think there's maybe i tried to like get the tripod in the door frame but still you could only get parts of it right which didn't seem worthwhile but yeah, it was um, it was a fun project, and the images came out with like a really nice typology. And so the only the next step was to just photocopy the photocopiers. Yeah, using the photocopiers within the institution, because 
that just made more sense. Was, were they made on every different machine, or was you would you would you just choose one to make with like the first the first edition? I just used the library printers, the library, yeah. yeah, because a lot of the office ones were. A lot of people looked at me in a very strange way. <laughs> a lot of people asked why, and you're like. Why are you asking why in an arts institution? Which I always find a very strange question. If you get a job in like an art school or a university, why do you ask questions of like, why are you doing this? Yeah. When really you should be quite open to broadening the expanse of the students' like interaction with their environment, especially with something being a very photographic institution mm. but nevertheless no one said really no it was just a case of pestering them a bit more <laughs> or getting another tutor to talk to another tutor and kind of pushing the boundaries yeah and so with you so this is going into so we've got three three separate editions yeah and the, are they all it's each one photocopied by the other yeah but so the first one which was in first one sold out quite quickly so I had to make a second one what was the run of that like just 10 okay they took like yeah it's one of those things that I'll make 10 because 10 no one wants to like hold on to loads of books yeah and also you make a you make a zine and you think no one's going to buy it or no one's going to want to look at it because I I made a template so a four piece of paper is that literally Photocopiers are A4 most of the time. Yeah. And then made like each page, each two images on each page, chopped them in half so you could like pop them on each other and then staple them. Because at that point, I was the only one making books on my course. Yeah. Yeah, which was very funny. What, no one else was doing? Well, I think everyone was kind of, it was very much the early days of that whole photo book self-publishing boom and I think people are like kind of in the background thinking about it or going into it yeah. but no one was doing it everyone was going slightly down the digital routes okay no one was getting like down and dirty right <laughs> and no one was like being that instigator everyone was doing it because they thought it was a professional move mm. not because it was like they just want to see what was, they were like just wanted to make a book and see what people like experiment as an artist book rather than I guess a photo book I guess we call it now yeah so uh, but yeah I, the whole idea of folding things in half and then stapling them was like I've totally forgot about <laughs> I like that you've got on the back here as well, like, sorry, reach graph, not photocopied. So, yeah, the third one was, uh, so, yeah, I made all these sheets, photocopied the sheets, and then put them together on the photocopy, and, like, in by hand and stapled them and made a lot of slipcase. Uh, but I destroyed the first, so I took the Polaroids out of everything and then destroyed it all. So I had to duplicate the first one to make the second one. And because I didn't have the blanks, I had to make the third one. Right. And I couldn't be bothered to make a hundred photocopiers using the photocopier. Okay. So <laughs> I just scanned it. I thought it had a different feel to it. Yeah. I think photocopiers are great for making half a dozen. But Resograph is so much more efficient, efficient yeah. medium to make over a hundred. I think in publishing terms, you've got to look at your quantity cost efficiently and for that all that jazz mm -hmm. and realize that making a hundred photocopy books, it's not worth the effort. No. And Resograph, a lot of the time is a lot much, it's got a nicer feel. It's actually truer to a photocopier as finding a photo, like, like a photocopier in this day and age. It's quite hard. Yeah, to get something that has that sort of has that feel in the most stage. most things that we use now are laser printers rather than actually 
like a 70s photocopier method mm -hmm. of like the whole idea of scanning and then the whole science of putting toner and like electrostatic. Now it's just like a scan and then you, they use the scan digitally to reproduce over and over again. Right. So you don't, you lose a lot of the, the aesthetic that we we heavily associate with like early punk flyers and zines as well. Yeah, because you mentioned that we've got like a couple of quotes in the front of the... Yeah, there's a Jello Braffer quote that came to very much mind. There's a really good book called, is it Fucked Up and Photocopied? I haven't heard of that one, Fucked Up and Photocopied. Yeah. Which is what, like gig flyers? Right, so it's everything, I think is it. Yeah, zines, everything that was basically photocopied during the early days of punk, I think, UK, US? Yeah. It's one of those books you look at and you think that's a bit cheesy, but they're all a bit <laughs> cheesy. But there's a couple of good quotes in it, but I like, because that's how, it, like, alternative tentacles, if you think about it, if you're going to make, if you've got a gig going on, how are you going to make posters? Are you, you're, not, you're not factory records and you get everything lovely screen printed. Yeah, no, exactly. You just like go to photocopy or just get like hundreds like slapped out. You pass them around the city and next morning they're gone. Yeah, I mean, that's uh, so, like, that's the first thing I sort of saw was like gig, was like ba like fanzines of band yeah. stuff. And then photographers would go on tour with a band and take pictures of them. Yeah. And then it was like, what is the easiest way to produce something that I could just give out at shows, the photocopier? And then I really like doing big stuff on them to just be like, make A0, A1 prints. I, I guess, you obviously, you're not working on an exact photocopy machine, but you're going into very like a cheap printing. Methods, especially process. like architectural blotters. Yeah. Something that should not be used for quality. Yeah. That's only meant for line work, which I must admit, there's been a few images so yeah there's been a few 10 8 photographs that i made and then actually reproduced using cheap blotters and they look amazing mm. i think the first one was actually i sent to the uh, second photo photocopy club show oh did you yeah yeah uh... like a huge a0 shot a set of lab coats oh which was uh I can't remember it. Which was lovely. Would it have been the first one? Second one. Second one. Yeah, one of my friends said, because after I made this, one of my friends said, I think they saw it a couple of years later, and like, you, you should uh, send work into the photocopy club. Right. Hmm, interesting. So what's out of the, obviously we don't have number one. We don't have number one, because <laughs> the number one was, I kept I kept one. But then it went on tour in a, I guess, a semi-famous show now called Adresha and Co. Okay. Which was a a show that Gagosian and a few other museums around the world put on of homages to Adresha's bookmaking. So how was it picked up for that? Like, what was the? I'm not sure. No. I think my gallerist had something to do with it. Okay. And. I think the the exhibition itself was huge. I know an awful lot of friends looking back at the catalogue that I didn't know then, but are very close friends now. Right. Um, but yeah, they took three of my books and they basically toured wow. every Gugnosian in like UK and US, went to around Europe and then got stuck in a storage facility in Germany. Okay. To the point where no one knew what was happening, really. And then they came back and, like, my garrison, Hannah, got an email saying, oh, this is the service charges for storage. And it's like, what? Like, why are they send them back? So she paid, but they came in a box that, if anyone's got anything back from, like, a European art storage facility, was, like, the crappiest box... <laughs> Like, but it had so many security tags around it that it was, it was beautiful. 
So instead of like opening up and taking the book out, right. I got the whole box framed oh. and gave it to her <laughs> as a gift. So yeah, sometimes the book is is about the aura, isn't it? Yeah. About the whole idea of having something that you can't see. Mm. Uh, but the first and the second look very much similar. Right. I mean, it's kind of nuts that I think, like, especially with what people sort of, the idea that we sort of think about zines is something that's very, like, in a sense, easy to make, something that's kind of disposable in a, so it's, you know, quickly done, made on the photocopy. But the idea that these, you know, they do become these beautiful objects that do end up being part of these museum collections and stuff like that. And I think it's it's interesting to have something, you can go from something so raw and so basic, especially making a zine on the photocopier about the photocopiers, and then it can slowly become this very sort of like... True. Treasured object. I, object. I, I think, I believe that... Um, my like artist book zine collection is much more valuable than the actual book collection I have. Right. Like I could probably, I could give away all my books. It wouldn't be a problem. Yeah. But some of the zines, like I've got archival boxes that if I open one up, it will take days to get through. And what's the reason for that? Because the the direct co connection to the the artist that made them. I think it was also. The lack of commerciality, like more of a response, the time. Some probably like some zines, as we both know, are they're made in a day. Some are made in like a year. Yeah. Some like the time, and also the whole connection with the artist. They you you feel it. You don't go into as a, like a a bookshop or an artist bookshop and go look through the zine collection. You kind of feel your way through it. A zine collection. Mm. You don't go like oh, I'm going to like I'm looking for something. You just like you grab randomly. Yeah, and it's like a fifty fifty chance because they're so small. There's no real detail on the spine. No, I was actually that before you turned up because you gave me a stack of your yeah your zines and I thought they were in this collection up here and I was going through and I was like I know they're sleeved and I know like the color of them but that's kind of it and so I'm sort yeah. of like going through each one. Just being like, oh yeah, no, ah, oh, yeah, and yeah, because you can't like once they are all slotted together. Slotted then, together yeah. is one of the worst things to archive. Yeah. Archiving zines is like a fundamental project that is gonna plague the art world in very soon, as a lot of a lot of artists that weren't considered artists and now got fundamental shows around the world, and they started all as doing punk flyers, yep. skateboarding, like zines, like the BMX world. It's all, they all have these like uh, connections to like culture, mm -hmm. like youth culture that is now not young because everyone that was grown up to be 50 year old, yeah. like skateboarders and BMXers. And, and the reason they're like so prolific is because they've realized they got to transfer all their skill sets that they learned from their like 16 to 20 mm. into their everyday life. And I guess it's funny to think about that now that like, I guess for the younger generation that, I mean, obviously there's lots of people are still making zines and zines are very like yeah. always on the grow. They always come in waves. Sometimes they're really popular brands take them on. Sometimes it just stays on the underground and that's yeah. whatever. Um, but I guess like, it's funny when you go into the sort of, the uh, history of quality, I guess, where we could say like going to university or whatever in like the 90s or the 2000s was very much the type of photocopier that you would get would give you a certain type of quality of print. Yeah. And now it can be something that's like, oh, it's just kind of just a cheap print and it doesn't particularly feel aesthetically... Yeah, pleasing as much yeah. as what we would try and find the oldest machine in the corner of the library that would have all the lines and have all the yeah. You need to find trig out trig trigation, but trigation. that that comes down to <clears throat> photography and printmaking. It's not everyone thinks you can just check a camera in front of something and take a photograph, but a lot of the time it comes down to 
an individual's response to being a an artist and a, a technician. So it's the whole idea of art and science mm. coming together and knowing like what something is capable of. You can't nothing, nothing can't do everything, and um, you can't. I think I had a very good conversation with some. Well, I wouldn't say a good, really boring conversation with someone about. <laughs> um, the quality of black and white prints, because to be honest, finding a, a cheap black and white print is quite hard now because everything gets printed in color, like a, um, a digital C type. Right, yeah. So, and that's not really cutting the mustard because everyone thinks you can just produce the black and white print by just clicking your button and doing a few of the bits on the levels. But really, a bit of like, Sound like magenta or something just creeps in, mm -hmm. and it just like it really pisses me off. Yeah, you've always got to print. Let the copier know just to print. And like black having toner. a black and white, having a black and white toner photocopier, it's gonna be black because that's the only color it does. Yeah, and if you play around the settings or make it a bit like crappier, it does bring out the the shitness. <laughs> <laughs> Which sounds bad, but it's something I really engage with. Yeah, I think you have to celebrate that. It should never be pushed away. In their, and that's an awful lot of reason why people use still shoot black and white film. They want they want to see that whole the whole idea why photography is such a surreal medium, and that's why the photo, um, photocopier is such a a valuable tool because it's kind of the ultimate surreal medium. It's like having a, a clumbersome friend in the corner mm. that can only do one job. <laughs> you, test it, you don't want it to do anything else apart from doing that one thing Yeah, because you know it's going to break everything else in the room. But if it does that one thing like perfectly and you don't mind it breaks over like every month, you're just like, you know how it's going to break or you fill up with tone. But there's something aesthetically pleasing about it that can only be done with... Uh, a photocopier and like low grade paper and just making something affordable yet like somehow really pleasing mm. and so as a final question to people watching what would be your first initial advice to start making zines to start start to start because like the first couple are like, just and also just have fun, just start and have fun. Don't get like a lot of people these days like, of, yeah, like round, get really confused about like the stigma and like they want to make something amazing. <laughs> <laughs> the only way it's amazing is by like, just like rep repetition, isn't it? And just having fun with it. Yeah, play. I think the be yeah the best thing in my mind is playing and just find that photo and copy it and just just not thinking about a computer or anything, just the paper machine. Yeah, using your hands, using your face, cut using things up, whatever lights, cut yeah. things up, and just playing with that machine and just seeing what you get out of it, and then and then bringing that into your yeah. I think InDesign work. is definitely your worst enemy, as yeah. I don't know. Does, does, does Sergey use in design? I hope not. <laughs> like some of the, there's a few like very prolific people that I think if they ever touch anything higher than a photocopier will probably break. Yeah. And that's what the magic's about. Just get like, use, every, use all the stationery you've ever wanted to buy and just, just make things that make you happy. Yeah. I think we'll end it on that. Great. <laughs> Thank you, Matt. Cheers, Griffin.